Okay, here we're looking at skin appendages, specifically nails and hair for this particular video series. So, uh, skin appendages, there's many of them. They're derived from the epidermis, but extend into the dermis. They include nails, hair and hair follicles, sebaceous glands, and sweat glands. In this video, we're going to focus on nails and hair in particular. You can see here, it's true for both um, humans and also other animals, and also nails. And this is hair that we're going to be focusing in on hair follicles and just hair in general. So we've seen this before. If you've seen some of the other videos or if you haven't, hopefully this is starting to make a little bit more sense here and what we're going to focus on. And if it doesn't make sense now, hopefully the end of the video, you'll start to pick up some of these um, structures of the skin and be able to understand them a little bit more. If you want to learn more about these, I have other videos going over some more details. So starting with this one, nails, we're just going to do a brief overview of nails. And there's scale-like modifications of the epidermis and made of hard keratin. They're that really hard kind of keratin. They correspond with hooves and claws, and they grow from a nail matrix. So if you look at your nail, this is how it looks on a cutaway. It might be a little gross there, but that's a cutaway of your nail, and it's that protective region there on the top. It's made from the same stuff as hooves and also um, the claws of the cat here. So our hair, filamentous strands of dead keratinized cells produced by hair follicles. So is hair alive? Well, no, it's kind of it's made up of dead cells there. Um, it contains hard keratin, which is tougher and more durable than soft keratin of the skin. So it does continue to grow here. This is our, um, we have our vessels here, our arteries and our veins at the very base, nerve endings down here, and then hair will continue to grow and uh, protrude out the surface here and continue down. Now, what's the function of hair, and where is, it, where is it found? Well, the functions are really to maintain warmth, as we see here. It also alerts the body in the presence of insects on the skin. It acts as little appendages when something crawls on us or lands on us, in this case. It can alert the body to kind of get that insect away. It guards the scalp against physical trauma, heat, uh, and sunlight. It's a protective layer uh, there. See here, the sheep here, definitely for a wool for the um, heat retention. Where is it? found on the body? Well, it's distributed over the entire skin surface, except for certain areas. The palms and soles and lips are areas that it's not found. Nipples and portions of external genitalia, also it's not found. So these are a few exceptions where hair is not distributed amongst the body. The basic hair anatomy, and I'm not going to go into great detail on this, uh, but there are different layers. Parts, as I pointed out before, it's a root embedded within the skin and the shaft projects above the skin's surface. There's three main layers. Uh, we can see in this black and white image here, the medulla is the main center portion, that's the core. We have the cortex and then the cuticle on the outside. Now, hair is dead, it's keratinized. If you look at the basic subunit, the basic building block is actually made from amino acids. And those amino acids get coiled and they get coiled on top of coils put together to form the hair. Why is hair so strong? Well, it's this multiple kind of twisting, binding, coiled layers. If you kind of want to prove this to yourself, you could take a paper towel uh, roll and just take one of the paper towels and kind of pull on the paper towel. You'll notice it'll tear very easily. You could take that same paper towel and start to twist it and turn it and then try to pull on it. It's going to be a lot harder. And that kind of is what the reason of the supporting reason for why these filaments are so strong. It's that twisting and turning. The same thing works with toilet paper. So the hair follicle, we have a little zoomed in here. The root sheath extends from the epidermal surface into the dermis. And bending hair stimulates the endings, hence the hair acts as touch-sensitive touch receptors. So I mentioned that down here, we have nerves that attach to that. And by bending the, the end here, that is being transferred, and that's what's alerting us to something present on our skin, such as an insect, for example. Goosebumps. Uh, the erector pili muscle, we're located right here, it's a bundle of smooth muscle. Now, if you haven't learned about muscles yet, smooth muscle is n involuntary muscle, and it contracts and makes the hair stand erect. So when it contracts, that's the muscle shrinking. So when that's shrinking or getting basically the muscles are sliding over one another and pulled together, that's going to take that hair and it's going to stand it up. The reason why it does this is it separates out, it creates a little bit of a barrier here, stops uh, air from getting in direct contact with the surface, at least a little bit of a 
lover factor here. And what that does is that kind of coats the skin here and allows it to stay a little bit warmer. Also, muscles contracting take energy. And that's also going to generate a little bit more heat. So not only does this kind of lift the area and create an insulating factor, that buffer factor between the cold air and the skin, it also generates a little heat from all these muscles contracting. I'm going to do a little math here with hair growth and hair loss. We're going to first talk about the positive here of hair growth. Hair growth, this is just an average I found, about 2 millimeters per week. This is active growing hair. Now, I pose a question here. How long in days would it take for your hair to grow to 6 inches, which is estimated to be about ear length, or 30 inches, about hip length in this case, at a growth rate of 2 millimeters per week? Now, your hair may grow a little faster, a little slower, but using this figure, how could we calculate this? I'm going to walk you through some of the basic math. If you're taking chemistry, dimensional analysis is what we're going to be using. So starting with our math calculations. Well, 2 millimeters per week is what's given. we got to convert that to centimeters. We're going to do millimeters to a centimeter conversion. So we take our millimeters, we convert it to centimeters. We want millimeters to cancel. So we put, if there's millimeters in the numerator, there's millimeters in the denominator here. 1 centimeter is equal to 10 millimeters. Now we're going to convert our millimeters, our canceled out, we have centimeters. We want centimeters to inches. Well, 2.54 centimeters is the same as 1 inch. So our centimeters cancel out. We're left with inches per week. Not what I was asking for, though. Now we want to calculate weeks, or cancel weeks and calculate days. So one week is seven days. So I put this in green here. This week cancels with this week because one week is the same as seven days. We multiply all our numerators. We get two. Multiply our, uh, all our denominators, we get 177.8. 2 divided by 177.8 equals 0 0.011248 inches per day. So how do we calculate what I asked it? 6 inches. Well, 6 inches, if you're growing it this much per day, it'll take approximately 533 days for your hair to grow 6 inches if it grows 2 millimeters per week. I also add another thing. What if it grows 30 inches? Well, to get to 30 inches, it's going to be 2,677 days. So that makes a little bit more sense. We convert um, cancel days out because there's 365 days in a year. Or to grow 30 inches at the rate of 2 millimeters per week, it would take about 7.3 years. And here's just the math again. Give me a little bit of the background to provide you with how I got to that answer located down here. Moving on, a little bit more of a negative, hair loss. The thinning, it's typically age-related. Male uh, pattern baldness, there's also female pattern baldness, as we see here, the progression. Uh, the incidence of male pattern baldness by age, the percent of the population, you notice that it increases as the age also increases. Advanced is this blue region, moderate is this kind of yellow region, and early stages, that um, dark burgundy type region there. So you can see, as males tend to get older, the percent of the population that have some instance of male pattern baldness increases overall. Now, we talk about hair, we talked about pigmentation. Hair color, well, hair color facts. Let's start with the facts. Well, pigmentation is by the melanocytes, and they're at the base of the hair. The amount of melanin for black or brown, and it's a distinctive uh, melanin for red hair. White is a decrease in melanin or, and air bubbles in that medulla of the hair, causing it to have its white appearance, losing its color, essentially. This is genetically determined through the influence of hormones in the environment. However, if you've uh, probably heard hair color, there's these bunch of stereotypes out there. So I put a picture of just three different people with three, uh, sorry, four different people with four different types of hair color. Blonde are usually considered uh, fun and social, or a negative would be unintelligent. Brunettes typically are seen as intelligent and mature, and the negatives are typically seen as plain. Black is mysterious and hard workers, or untrustworthy on the negative side. Redheads being unique and interesting, but also as a negative as aggressive. Now, I found these these are stereotypes. None of these really have any science that hold true. Uh, but if you look at these four um, images, do you kind of see how these stereotypes can get generated? And again, this is just people uh, progressing these stereotypes. They don't hold true at all. One thing that does hold true, this is particularly for um, redheads, um, kind of a quick fact, redheads are actually harder to sedate than other hair groups. 
uh, using the most common an 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 anesthetics, sorry, they require an average of 20% more anesthesia. That's also, they also have a higher tolerance than normal people, which is other um, hair colors, to pain. This is because of the mel melanocortin 1 receptor. It's a mutation that gives red hair and also triggers excessive release of pheomelanin, which is, among other things, stimulates the brain receptor related to pain sensitivity. So just kind of interesting note about the redheads. Now, there's not many of them. Uh, one to two percent of the world's population naturally has red hair. National Ge Geographic made a prediction that by the year 2060, redheads would be extinct. So interesting there. And this gives you just a little bit of the largest population groups. Scotland, 13 percent are natural redheads. Ireland, 10 percent. Wales, up to 10 percent. In the United States, only about two to six percent are natural redheads. The reason why I bring this up is this came up in an article I put down here for there's little demand, demand for a redhead-headed sperm. Sperm makes wanted to turn down redheads because they weren't getting uh, demand for that sperm. The world's largest sperm bank started turning down redheads donors due to the small demand. Well, there's other ethical issues, but this should be easy, right? If there's a male that's redhead, they're just going to deny them, and that should eliminate the redhead genes from the population. Well, that's actually not that easy. So, eliminating redhead genotype. It, you can't really ban redhead sperm because, yes, okay, the male is red, it's showing that. But remember from our Hardy-Weinberg equations, there's also a lot of people that are carriers. And because there's more carriers than actual redheads, there's actually a lot of the redhead gene located within uh, the population. That allele is actually very common. There's a lot of carriers, even though not many express it. So what sounded effective does not actually have supporting science. So banning redhead sperm donors has really a small effect. This is the policy of banning redheads, and we see there's a, there is a decrease, but not nearly as dramatic as with no policy. So just an interesting fact here, how we have that allele that's carried, many people are carriers, that simply what sounded easy to ban redheads uh, to eliminate that from the sperm bank did not actually hold true. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of the science and kind of some of the stereotypes and also some of the background on hair color and nails as these appendages of the skin.